Welcome everyone to the fall of 2022 wetlands, water wetlands and watershed seminar. It's the first time that we're all back in person. So we're trying to remember how we used to do it. Um, and we're also live streaming now out there to the world. Hello everyone on YouTube. We're very pleased to have our first speaker of the semester is Dr. Angela Shadell. And we're gonna have Dr. Christine Angelini, the director of the Center for Coastal Solutions give the introduction and then we'll hand it over to you. Excellent. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to this uh, fall 23 um, semester. Still 2022. Uh, so 2022. I'm uh, anyways, I've been working on budgets for 2023. So sorry about that. I'm very excited to um, introduce Dr. Angela Shadell, uh, who is the vice president at Taylor Engineering based in Jacksonville, Florida, um, where she leads the coastal planning group. Um, she oversees a variety of projects conducting vulnerability assessments, um, creating adaptation strategies and advocating for long-term resilience planning for local municipalities, the state of Florida, and federal clients. As a recently retired uh, naval officer, Dr. Shadell served, served 20 years as a helicopter pilot and an engineering professor at the U.S. Naval Academy. She currently serves on the Florida Building Commission's Hurricane Research Advisory Board and is a community resilience educator for the National Alliance of Preservation Commissions. Her experience conducting resilience planning for national historic landmark communities is unmatched in the coastal engineering industry. Um, I've had the pleasure of collaborating with Dr. Shadell as well, and I can tell you she is a fabulous uh, collaborator, um, and we're really thrilled to hear about some of her work with Taylor Engineering today, focused on resilient Florida um, and the intersection of policy and planning for coastal communities. So join me in welcoming Dr. Shadell. Well, thanks so much for having me. I appreciate being an invited guest to the um, Center for Wetlands here at University of Florida. For those of you online who can't see, there's 16 people in the room. So we are 2022. It's a brave new world. We're back in person and some people are masked and some aren't. And so I'm glad to be able to be here in person. It's uh, I've done a lot of seminars in Zoom the last couple of years. So it's really cool to actually well, it's great to have be you. able yeah. to see my audience. Yeah. So thanks. Um, as Christine said, I work at Taylor Engineering in Jacksonville, Florida. Um, I'm a fifth generation Florida native. Um, both my father and my brother are UF grads, and my son is currently here as a sophomore. So I have a great love for University of Florida. I was actually born in Gainesville, so I love coming back to where I was gator born. <laughs> so I'm going to talk about um, the motivation behind my talk and what is going on in resilience in the space in Florida right now. Um, as Dr. Angelini said, I retired from the Navy and retired from academia to move back to my home state to bring kind of what the lessons I was seeing in my research from all over the US and the world and bring it back to Florida and just try to make a difference. And Florida has been doing a lot since I moved here back four years ago. So um, we'll also talk about, you know, what my definition for resilience is and how we're incorporating it and what the Navy is, what the Navy is doing, what the federal government is doing and what you're gonna see specifically in Florida. And I'll give you two examples of projects. The picture here is the Naval Academy and this was a road I would have to traverse to go to and from faculty parking because parking on campus there is a, not as bad as here, but it's pretty bad. And um, there are many times where my car wouldn't make it through there. So is this it was, the Potomac is down near DC. So yeah. Annapolis, Maryland oh, okay. is, um, it's on the Severn River on the Chesapeake Bay. So it's about 45 minutes due east of DC. And um, yeah, that parking garage, that parking area, that's the main road into um, where the faculty parking is at Hospital Point. And I literally would check the tide chart, the tide <laughs> chart, and understand if I could go that way. And you know, because if not, you have to go all the way around campus. So it was very interesting how that affected my day-to-day -day commute. And we're seeing that in more and more communities. So me, to, to me, this was motivation for studying sea level rise. So I'm gonna start in St. Augustine. I live in Jacksonville. St. Augustine is uh, about 45 minutes south. And I wanted to show you what we're seeing. And I'm gonna show you three different flooding types. So in St. Augustine, um, about two years ago, so during the perigee and spring tides where you've got um, the moon, the sun, and the, the earth aligned so that you know you have the highest high tides of the year. People call them king tides, but what we saw was there was a perigean spring tide. We had a nor'easter that had had onshore winds for a few days, just three inches of rain, and my clients in St. Augustine are sending me these pictures. The reason I say my clients is because what you see in the center is a seawall that Taylor Engineering designed and did some of the building that construction had been for um, in 2014. So I'm very familiar with the site. I know what elevation it's at and it's retaining water, which isn't necessarily what we wanna do. Um, and all that water is actually backflow coming up gravity fed high tide just up through the drains. So all it takes is a simple backflow preventer, but it's actually going into the road. I've stood there and watched the water come up with the student group at high tide. So the city is very proactive on this, but it's occurring more regularly. 
And on the right, the city has a flooding tool. So they have this really cool online tool that residents can take a picture and say, hey, I'm standing here with my yardstick. This is where the flooding is. So you can see that same day, there were 42 flooding reports. So a really cool citizen science of a way to get, you know, for public works to be able to say, whoa, whoa, they had flooding here. And there a lot more communities are doing this, unfortunately. But it is a good way if you need data to be able to say, hey, take a picture of where you are, take your yardstick with you so we can measure it. Um, obviously, there's more scientific ways to go out and survey it. But this is a really good way to get data, which then helps understand why we need to be more resilient. So another flooding event, you look at the dates. This was actually two weeks later. Um, so this was also September of 2020. Once again, another high tide event. But this was actually due to flash flood raining. So if you look, this is inshore. Um, I was, I did not take that picture because I was driving in that. And it was horrible. And I thought my car was going to stall out due to the water. Um, but look at the, the rain event. You know, if you know anything about rainfall, uh, three and a half inches in one and a half hours is a lot of rain. And their antiquated stormwater system couldn't keep up with it. Um, so yeah, they were closing the roads. That's the road um, into this King Street, into St. Augustine on the left. And on the right, that's um, the main US-1. And I was in that, actually, I was in a boat in that thinking, I, we can't see anything. How are we going to get out? And the entire parking lot was flooded when I got back. So we, you know, now I've covered that high tide event. Here's the flash flood. And then um, one of the students in here is from St. Augustine. We just talked about this. You know, here's Hurricanes Matthew and Irma, which really hit the St. Augustine and Jacksonville area really hard. Um, what you see in the picture on the right is me actually standing at the high water mark at the, the Avenida Menendez Road that is right at the fort of the National Park Service fort there. So you can see the water was up to my shoulders. You know, I'm five foot five. You can imagine that water, you know, with waves coming over that seawall that I pictured. Um, not somewhere you want to be. And obviously you can see the pictures there. There were no cars that were on that road that, you know, that, that survived that. And then I've got the flooding at the Avenue Menendez seawall. You can see in the graphic on the bottom. The flood, the high water mark was at seven feet above the now D88 dam. Um, the good part was the wall retained that because that's actually the 100 year storm or the 1% the annual chance storm. So just we've seen some devastating effects prior to this. Hurricane Dora was the previous storm on record. That was in 1964. So St. Augustine, Jacksonville had really had a good run of it. This was just unfortunately the perfect storm, both of them. All right, so now I want to talk about mean sea level. My motivation and thinking about resilience is like, why do we care? Why, why are we seeing more events now? We're seeing more events because globally, you can see on the graphic, we have an upward trend in the data of water levels across the world. So this is um, an international data set. You can see it goes back to 1883. Um, that's in Europe is where that comes from. It's then um, taking data that's coming from a satellite since 1992. So we're actually able to look at the altimetry data. And you can see the moving average there. You know, it's, we've got you know, nine inches of sea level rise in that first 140 years. And then after that, the next, you know, that the last century was six inches of sea level rise. We're like, oh, that's not too bad, right? Yeah, but we've had almost three inches in the last, not even quarter century. So if you do the rate, what are we looking at for the next century? Well, if you take that three inches over 25 years, multiply that by four, that's a foot. That's a foot in the next hundred years. The rate of sea level rise has doubled. There's a lot of reasons for it. I'm not a climate scientist, but this is just, you know, the use case for resilience and why we should really care. I care because I'm a Floridian. You should care if you're a Floridian or a student here. Um, this is just a, a geologist presentation um, from 2008. It's one of my favorite slides. It just shows that, you know, yes, it's cyclical. Yes, this has happened. But, you know, 120,000 years ago, sea level was 20 feet higher. How do we know this? Geological records. Any students here, you know, gone out to any of the rivers or creeks and found megalodon teeth not too far from Gainesville? Yeah, so we, we know that the oceans we're in that area on the far left that is blue. And then in the center, during the last ice age, 18,000 years ago, when so much water was up, you know, land ice, what are you seeing? 420 feet lower, right? There was less water that was in the oceans. And how do we know this? Once again, you can find evidence of seashores and, and, and waves in the geological record. And here we are today. So this is just to give you a good example of it has been changing. It will continue to change. We're just in the middle of an upward trend right now. When we talk about resilience, I see resilience defined about 100 different ways. I'm an engineer, so I'm going to give you the engineering background resilience the way I see it. Any engineers remember like a, the stress strain curve here? Have you ever been in a materials lab and they're stretching that metal piece and you're waiting for it to break, right? Well, the, this is, remember, this is the, the stress strain curve that you're seeing on the graphic. That green actually happens to be called resilience. And the resilience, the area under the slope there, 
is when you're stretching something that's metal or any type of material that will stretch and it's got some ductility. And what happens when I release that pressure or that stress? It goes back to what it was, right? It's resilient, it bounces back. It bounces back from that adversity or that pressure that was there. What happens once I reach the yield strength? It then stretches to the point where eventually it's going to fail. That's the ultimate strength and when it fractures. But it's interesting when I started looking at resilience, I was like, oh, wait, wait, I taught stress strain curves. I remember this. That was the area under the curve there. So going back to my very basic material science, it's really recovering without changing into something that's different. And I'm seeing a lot of communities that it's hard for them to bounce back quickly after a disaster, like you know, Irma and Matthew in the St. Augustine area that I just showed. And resilience to me when it comes to coastal flooding is like, how do we get better to recover? without completely changing the fabric of our communities and our wetlands. Like we want, we want everything to be stronger and better. So I'm gonna talk about the legislation that goes into this and what the state of Florida is doing that's really pertinent. So the state of Florida back in 2018 started this Florida Resilient Coastlines Program. It's under the Department of Environmental Protection or FDEP. And you can see they just started you know, with 13 projects, about $600,000. Not a lot, they were giving about 75,000 per community to just look at a vulnerability assessment. What is happening? you know, in my community with flooding, <clears throat> excuse me, what critical assets um, are, are, would possibly be damaged and what adaptations we could do. You can see on the map there, it's grown since 2018. All those little blue dots are state funded projects that don't require a match. So you've got local communities getting state money to either do an in-house or pay an engineering or planning firm to, to study it. Um, the last thing on there is parallel flood compliance. You hear that a lot in the circles I work with and I'm seeing, Dr. Kaplan's shaking his head, I've never heard of that. That's good, because I have a slide here. So there's a Florida statute from 2015, which everyone in the engineering field and planning calls parallel flood. It required every coastal community to look at the effects of high tides events, storm surge, flash floods and stormwater runoff and sea level rise, if they have a coastal management element in their comprehensive plan. So if you're a planner, then you have a comprehensive plan. It talks about land use and zoning and growth development in a community. I'm an engineer. I didn't know anything about planning until I started looking into this. But this parallel flood requires communities to at least put something, to codify it, that we will look at that. To do that, you can't just say, yep, high tide's going to happen, storm surge. You have to do some modeling. So that's what the models are on the right. This is from the Florida De Department of Economic Opportunity. And they funded a whole bunch of pilot studies. The St. Augustine was one in 2016. They did one up in Pensacola. So while we say resilience is just like new in the state of Florida, we were finding different ways to talk about it back in 2015. It's not really new. So now I'm going to talk about the most recent statutes that have come out in the past three years. So I'm going to start with 2021. Um, it established the um, Resilient Florida Grant Program. So it's just kind of changed the name. There was $520 million worth of funding. So remember, it was only 569,000 back in 2018. I mean, they've put a lot more funding behind this. This is Governor DeSantis and the legislature, um, you know, bipartisan saying we need to do something to make Florida be resilient. I think they were motivated when they saw um, Miami and that Miami will sink on the cover of Rolling Stone magazine. I think that would say we need to, you know, be really innovative in Florida. It also established um, an annual statewide flooding and sea level rise plan, as well as established the Florida Flood Hub. And then there's a statewide vulnerability um, and data set that's soon to come in the next couple of years. And this is a graphic here that comes from the, the very first presentation I went. And it defines what critical assets are in terms of um, the Resilient Florida Grants Program and what, you can, what a community, and it's only for local communities in Florida and counties, municipalities, and the water management districts um, to get funding from, as well as like resilient re regional planning. What I wanted to draw your attention to, which is really pertinent for people who are doing wetland studies, is that number four at the very bottom of the slide? I know it's small, but natural, cultural, and historic resources, including conservation lands, parks, shorelines, surface waters, wetlands, historic and cultural assets, are considered critical assets as per the legislation. So this is written into the law, which means if you know of a community that wants to do a wetland restoration project, they want to re-wet a wetland that was farmland that you know now we look at regrading it and re-wetting it, you can actually apply for resilient Florida grant funding. And I think. Most people think, well, it's a fire station I'm going to harden, or, you know, I've really got to think about doing some beach nourishment. This actually has wetlands in there. So if you have communities that you know of, or projects, especially with research, 
you know, encourage them to apply for this funding. I will say the grant cycle closes tomorrow. Um, <laughs> I know because all of I was up late last night, and a lot of my colleagues are that are probably watching online are thinking, Angela, quit, you know, go faster. I've got to get back to my grants. So uh, next year, the grant cycle will probably be July one to September one, as it has been. But just keep that in mind. You know, a critical asset is considered conservation lands. So just this year, um, there was a new Florida statute on resilience. It officially established an office of resilience and appointed a chief resilience officer. We had a chief resilience officer. We'd actually had three. We're in our third right now, Dr. Westbrooks. But um, it officially, you know, codified it and put it underneath the office of the, of the governor. Um, this was new. This the second bullet here. It required vulnerability assessments, not just for coastal communities, like we talked about with the parallel flood, but also for non-coastal communities. So Alachua County has been doing one. Um, I mean, if it rains, it's going to flood, right? So we can't just say, oh, we're really concerned about only sea level rise. We're concerned about flash flood events. We're concerned about, you know, ground groundwater that's rising. There are so many different things that go into being a resilient community. So it's really nice that they're including non-coastal communities in this. And there is, you know, a, a mandate to do it. It's really, really great. Um, it required some ranking for projects within that statewide flood and sea level rise plan. And they, they set out very particular um, criteria for evaluating those projects for ranking them so that it's an even playing field across the, the Florida. And then it also um, required the Florida Flood Hub to provide tidal storm surge and rainfall induced flooding data sets. And the graphic on the right is a um, standardized vulnerability assessment scope of work that I helped DEP write. Um, this is all the layers you can imagine that go into a vulnerability assessment, you know, from evapotranspiration to precipitation, sea level rise, storm surge, all the land usage, critical evacuation routes, elevation, groundwater. I mean, when I'm saying we're modeling flood exposure, those are a lot of the tools we're using. It's high level GIS modeling with a lot of really good data and science behind it. All right, so now I want to get into slip study. So um, two years ago, the sea level impact projection study was mandated by the state, and it required any state funded major construction to do a slip study. Um, DEP called me because of a website that I had created for another entity and said, can you figure this out? And I was like, we'd love to talk to you about it. Um, that ended up with Taylor Engineering and my brainchild of resilience coastal engineers figuring out how we do a slip study. Um, they have to be published on the DEP website. So if you go to the website that's here, I'll show you the link in a minute, you can see published ones. It's, it's essentially the regulatory teeth behind it are requiring any state funded construction to look at sea level rise, kind of like that parallel flood. Um, it doesn't mandate you have to adapt anything, but it does provide some adaptation. So what is a slip study? These words, you don't have to read them all. These come directly out of the statute. Um, I highlighted the green ones because I think they're really pertinent to what we do here in science. You know, they wanted something that was interdisciplinary, that was scientifically based, um, that looked at flooding, inundation, and wave action, and that provided some alternatives for coastal structures. So a lot of words there just to say, I'm going to show you what the website looks like for slip, and then you can check it out on your own. Um, there's a lot of data out there on sea level rise. I just did this for fun. I didn't use this data, but I went to data.gov. There's 26,000 data sets for sea level rise. It's a lot. It's really hard if you don't know what you're looking for to sift through and find what is most pertinent for your layers in looking at flooding. Um, the layers listed on the left are the ones that we included. Um, it's the data that you can see that comes from our federal agencies. It's coming out of NOAA, FEMA, National Fish and Wildlife. Um, we use the Florida Building Codes. The Army Corps um, depth damage curves for evaluating um, cost of uh, damage to structures. And then we use some NOAA and EPA adaptation measures. So really try to you know, look local at Florida and then look you know, at the national level and say, what's the most credible data that's there? Um, when we met with DEP, they told us the first thing they needed was it had to be user friendly. You know, we're trying to create this slip study and they don't want it to be any undue burden on the, on the, on the, the counties, right? If you're a county, you're like, okay, I'm going to put in a seawall here, I'm going to elevate my lifeguard station. The last thing you want to do is be like, okay, you got one other report, you got to pay an engineer to write. So we we tried to say, well, let's take the engineering brain of what I would analyze and write it into an algorithm that makes it very simple and very user friendly. What's really cool is I thought we were just writing this slip report where it's this algorithm. They actually wanted it to be publicly available. So it was kind of neat where that's not what the statute said. But that's what DEP said, well, if we're going to do this, let's make it so that anyone in the state of Florida can look at it. So it's publicly available. And it illustrates those risks using that data that I talked about. And it's, you can go in there and you can type in your address and go and say, is my mom's house going to flood or not? It gives you the ability to look at that. So this is just, um, a, I'm going to go through some slides fairly quickly because we're short on time, but I want to show you what you can see. So this is fdep-slip.org. I think I've got it on one of the slides in here. 
but um, or you can Google FDEP and SLIP. When you go into the public view, um, you will see a couple different layers on the left. So on the far left of the screen, those are the different coastal layers we analyze. We're looking at the sea level rise. This is being pulled directly from NOAA's digital coast. So if you've seen their sea level rise, you are the same thing. It's at the slider. You can move it up and down. I don't know why it goes to 10. I tried to tell the state I didn't want to go to 10 feet because it's a, what happens is um, a client of mine went on there and he's like, look, sea level rise, how bad it is. And he went all the way up to 10. And he's like, Michael, everything I own is underwater. I'm like, um, okay, well, let's talk about the probability of having 10 feet of sea level rise in the next 50 years. Although the, last week's, yeah, latest study, maybe, maybe you should go kind of high. Maybe, yeah. but if you're a property owner, you can't necessarily afford to plan yeah. for 10 feet today. Absolutely. So let's plan for one and a half or three feet today. That's more economically um, feasible, I would say. And I think socially responsible, but yeah. So the doom and gloom is there. I've actually talked to the state and like, can we maybe bring it down to six feet? Cause I think 10 feet is just some crazy extreme scenario that I'm not, we don't know how the ice sheet dynamics will play out. So yeah, we've got no sea level rise in there. It's just a slider that you can move up and down. Um, we, the next one down is the NOAA regional sea level rise scenarios. There is a new NOAA report out this year um, because we did this website two years ago. This is the NOAA 2017 data and we're mandated at that as per what's in the rule right now. So I can't change that, but you can click on anywhere within that black dotted line area, which is the coastal building zone where a slip is required and it will interpolate. It does a distance weighted interpolation between the two nearest tide gauges and comes up with a sea level rise at that spot at different um, periods and time. And we also did the translation to NAVD88 because if you're an engineer, it's really hard to say, well, I want to look at mean high water, or mean low water, or mean sea level. So we did a translation to NAVD88 to make it all the same datum that when you're building something, you don't have this weird conversion. Yeah. So that was, um, NOAA has this, but this is kind of innovative the way we, we, we did it. It's just a little bit different. Um, we put the FEMA flood hazard layer in there. If you're familiar with the the digital flood insurance rate maps, we're pulling these directly from FEMA. So you can click, actually on this one, you don't click, you can look anywhere and you can see what zone you're in and what the base flood elevation is. In the, building. the next one's high tide flooding. Um, this one comes directly from NOAA Digital Coast. Once again, we didn't create any of these layers, we're just repackaging them in one spot where people can use them. Um, within the high tide flooding layer, it's saying these are areas where um, when you have those annual occurrences of tidal flooding, kind of like the ones I showed before with the perigee and spring tides, this is where the flooding will occur. And there is a new report out just last week talking about the increase of that high tide flooding and the increase of occurrences um, that have occurred just this year and in future years. We call it nuisance flooding also. Um, we had to look at wind zones. There's a thing they're talking within the slip um, statute that required us to look at um, flying debris. And so with flying debris, we went to the Florida Building Code and we pulled out the wind zones that are in the Florida Building Code for the different risk categories of buildings. So for example, a building risk category four, which is what you're looking at, that would be a nuclear power plant or a hospital or something that you do not want any wind damage on it in a hurricane. Something like a building risk category one is a warehouse um, or you know a, a small cabana type structure. So the wind zone requirements for engineers to build to are actually lower for those. And you can and the drop down there, you can click and select all the different ones. We looked at terrain too, you know, topography, how, how high or how low is my land that I'm doing this on is a really very good indicator in Florida, how flat we are, of how, where the flooding is going to be. So anywhere within the coastal buildings, and once again, that's that dashed line, um, you can click on it and it will give you the terrain elevation using the topo we're pulling from NOAA. Um, in NAVD 88. And NOAA does update their website periodically, like every month. And I know the state of Florida right now is getting new peninsular LIDAR. Um, I think I saw the other day, like 38 uh, uh, counties within Florida had the latest LIDAR. So it's neat. The Florida updates it, they send it to USGS, and then it gets to NOAA, and then it is pulled. We're live pulling it. So it's a, it's a good way to pull the data is that I don't have to maintain all those databases. <laughs> And the last layer I wanted to show you is the wildlife layer. Uh, this was created by National Fish and Wildlife um, Foundation. They did a resilient coast study back in 2020, and I had gone to a few of their, um, their workshops and was part of the, the local people on the ground looking in the St. Augustine area. The darker areas that you see, like on the right, like down in the Cape Canaveral area, or maybe a little bit higher up in uh, Brunswick, those happen to be habitat areas, like very high either corridors or areas where there's a high concentration of habitat that tends to be vulnerable. And it's basically a high value of watersheds with um, you know, priority species prioritized by NIFLA. So this was an informational one, but it's, it's pretty neat. You can actually go to the website and dig in and see their, their direct report and pull the data from them. All right, so now you see the public view, now you're like, what's, what's behind? Like, what's, what's the real thing behind this? The meat of this 
is the algorithm of the slip study report. And if you're a signed in user, which you have to be a local municipality, a county, a regional resilience entity, a planning council, um, a special a special taxing district in the state of Florida, you can ask DEP for a sign assignment. And I might, might see if I can get UF one so you guys can experiment with it and give me some feedback. Um, but you sign in with your um, organization and your name. And you see there's a new button there on the left. That button for slip study tool wasn't there before. When you click create a report, it says you have to choose a location. And then it asks you for some basic data. Once again, the state wanted it really basic. They didn't want a lot of burden to the person using it. So what you see there is you're typing in your name, because that's going to be your slip study name of the project, um, the county that it's in, if it's um, a building, like a vertical construction, or if it's horizontal construction, like a parking garage, a road, a utility. Um, vertical construction has those risk one through four categories. Horizontal construction will give you a different drop down to let you know what it is. Um, then a critical elevation. Um, this is one tricky part because that critical elevation is selected by the user. So could you manipulate it to say what you want? Yes. Will this be publicly available for the public to see? Yes. We have some identifiers, all those little eye buttons there help you define what that is. A critical elevation, in my definition, should be the finished first floor elevation, the FFE. It should be what is it that's flooded? Or if you're looking at mechanicals, maybe it's not the finished first floor of the building. Maybe it's, uh oh, my HVAC and my standby generator are lower. So you're looking at the lowest elevation of critical assets that you're trying to protect. Um, we type in the critical elevation, that's critical to the algorithm. So you have to make sure you get a good number in there. Um, the construction start year, the expected life, and then the estimated construction costs. So low hanging fruit, not a lot of data that needs to go into that. And then when you hit go, you get the circle that you watch. Um, the reason the circle is there is it will tell you as it's pulling the data, it goes out. We're going to NIFWF and pulling the data. We're going to FEMA and pulling the data. FEMA one usually is a lot longer. We're thinking about pulling that in-house in the future. It, it, FEMA just always takes a long time. It's a lot of data. Um, and then this is what it looks like. It's just a simple PDF um, and you can save the report. You can export and print it. If you are a municipality that has to use it, you're gonna review it, submit it to DEP. They will review it and they will publish it on their website. Um, what it has on the top left is just a review of this is what you input. Here's your map. Here's what you told us and the date that you did it, date and time, and who, who was the organization that input it. You can see I put this one in, so it's Taylor. The really critical data is a summary on the bottom left. There was something mandated in the statute called um, average annual chance of substantial flood damage. The way it was defined substantial flood damage is when 25% um, of the building value is been damaged. Um, so we use the Army Corps depth damage curves for um, like a, a median structure to come up with that. That average annual chance of damage is only available for horizontal structures because we don't have a really good depth damage functions on roadways and parking lots and utilities. So that's one thing is that sometimes you might get NA and it does, it will pop up and say NA and here's why it's NA. And now you're getting the data. It's going to summarize all the data that's there. What is your FEMA flood zone? What is the base flood elevation? What is the terrain there? What is that intermediate high sea level rise scenario? at the point in time, the furthest year of your design life. That's why you put in the dates. What is that wind zone? It is using the FEMA um, flood insurance rate map data, a whole bunch of different um, frequencies and return periods over time to actually do the algorithm to do the percentage of the average annual chance. Then it provides us for statute these cool adaptation strategies. And there is an algorithm that says, you know, what adaptation strategies are appropriate for this. You can see it's very general. But you can go to the website and some of these blues are hyperlinks that you can actually see an actual project funded by the state. And this gives you an idea of how long does it take? Is it a macro or micro? Is it gray or green? You know, you can, we did use some that are um, green solutions. I don't have them in here, but we got living shorelines and wetland restorations. Um, then here's a summary of, of all that data. So there's the FEMA flood information, the sea level rise scenarios. It's actually a table that goes out to 2100 that's um, decadal. And then we've got a graphic of what it looks like. We even have high tide flooding. That's the graphic on the left and the high tide flooding expected days per year in the future, the wind zones and then the terrain. So it's a very simple report. There's a lot going on in the background, but it should give DEP an idea of, does this seem like a good idea to spend state money on or not? So, all right, that's it on slip. I'm gonna move on. And now I wanna talk about a vulnerability assessment. So these projects are what I've been working on since I've been at Taylor for the past four years, really going into communities, cities, and counties and saying, what are your vulnerabilities and how do we find them? So I'm gonna talk about how the state, um, the state guidance that goes out for this and what it looks like. So I'm now switching from, we just looked at the big high level overview that the state provides to now state funding goes into a vulnerability assessment. Uh, my team finished the business resilience plan last year in uh, summer of 2021. 
And the first thing we have to do is, you know, meet with the client and meet with their steering committee. And typically, depending on the client, it could be the city engineer, which it is. It's Kathleen Whedon in City of Venice. And I appreciate her letting us use her logo and her graphic and the, um, to talk about this. But we had our stormwater engineer there and her public works folks and her utility folks because they have a public utility. So it's you can't just talk to one. We had our historic preservation officer come and attend meetings. Um, these were all online because it was during COVID. But depending on the community, there's a different flavor and a different feel to who's on the steering committee. Uh, City of St. Augustine, I did some work for them, and it was archaeologists and economists, you know, very much into cultural assets. Some will have, they want the whole environmental team there too. It just depends on the community and what they want to do. Um, so in identifying those critical assets, we ask them, what do you want to evaluate? What is critical to you? Turns out with Venice, they have a really cool historic district. So they wanted to look at historic properties and historic districts, which is something that I was like, oh, I hadn't thought of that. But it is a critical asset that's listed. Um, then we go in and we evaluate those. We look at compound flooding, so sea level rise and storm surge. We're soon to add rainfall. We're doing an update to this plan this year. Um, and then we try to illustrate that. How do you present this to the public, to the city council? Like they really need an need a understanding. And you know, while you and I might be able to do GIS websites all day, sometimes you just really want a map on an easel that you can go to a public forum and say, where's my house and how does this work? So I think the maps and the tables, the graphical representation of flooding in the future is so important in terms of public outreach. Um, and then we come in and we provide recommendations. You know, where, where should you focus some, some, some time and money right now to really look at adapting and what are some strategies you can use? So I'll cover all these um, a little at a time here. So this once again was the Florida Resilient Coastland, Coastlines Program. That's that acronym up there. This was a planning guidebook that was published in um, 2018 that um, DEP did in, in association with NOAA. And it's a great book. Um, if you do anything in adaptation, you should go and just Google it. It's available online. It's a free PDF. I've got a nice printout in my office, which is great to take with clients and turn the pages. And I like this graphic on the left. It, we call it um, our Publix. Like, um, it's the, the belt that you're putting your groceries on. You, know, you, you start here and you go here, and this is where it ends up. So I talked about that steering committee. That's the number one, is establishing the context and the guiding principles and motivations behind it. Who are we going to talk to? Who are the important public outreach? Then we move on to that vulnerability assessment, which is the, where you're really getting into the engineering and the science and um, looking at all the different depths, flood depths and the elevations of, of the data. Number three, the adaptation strategies. You know, what, how adaptive is this asset? You know, can it, can it take some flooding? There are some fire stations that like, yep, the water can roll in and roll out and it's okay if it gets flooded. Not so much for, you know, the city hall or the county jail or the public library or an evacuation shelter. So you really have to think very, every building is very site specific and community specific. Um, and then some adaptation strategies go into that. And then number four is how are we going to implement this? You know, I don't want to make a plan of like, here's your vulnerability assessment. Okay, bye bye, put it on a shelf. Like, I want to help create some action that we help you go out for funding, which is why I said I was up late last night writing a lot of grants because I'm trying their implementation grants to actually get solutions in the ground. So when you do a vulnerability assessment, this is the science or the background that, I, that we put into it. So on the left, we're starting with that build infrastructure. You know, what, what do I need to know? Let's just say it's City Hall. I need to know its location, exactly where it's situated. Um, I need to know the elevation, not only of the land surrounding it, the topography, but once again, like I talked about, what, what am I concerned about? Does it have a basement? We're in Florida, hopefully not a basement, but some places do have, very older buildings have them. Um, the ownership is it city, county, private. For example, one municipality had a private hospital, but they wanted me to evaluate it. I was like, well, you, you guys can't adapt it. They're like, yeah, but we want to know the community really cares. So sometimes you have to add that private critical asset. Sometimes the ownership is state, you know, it's a, it's federal highway, you know, that it's D, it's DOT. So it's understanding who owns these assets and then historic. That was when we added for Venice. Um, looking at the flood risk, this is how we did it. We did some flood scenarios and I'll show you a graphic. We ended up doing nine. We looked at today's nuisance flooding. That's the mean higher high water. That's like the average of the highest high tides of the year. Um, we looked at one and a half foot and three foot of sea level rise. That's a story for another day why we picked those, but those were just ones we could conceptualize. I can conceptualize one and a half and three foot and we can talk about planning for that in the next 50 years. Um, and then we looked at the 50 year and 100 year or the 2% or 1% annual chance storm surge. Um, we weren't sophisticated enough to add rainfall yet, but now the state wants us to add rainfall. So that's in the next cycle. And then you compare those and looking at them on a map, we just kind of flooded the whole area and said, wow, what's vulnerable? And so we categorized them in terms of you know, those critical and essential public facilities, and then also historic structures and historic districts. And I'll show you some maps so you can see them. 
So these are our flood scenarios. Once again, I said they were nine. So you can see this is compound flooding. We put sea level rise um, with the 50 year and 100 year storms on top. So we can see what do those look like. And it's interesting, depending on the community and the topography, what comes out because we've done these for a few different communities. And sometimes you're like, oh, I think I know what the answer is. And it may not be the answer in that community, just depending on how the stormwater drains go and where the water, where the water flows and floods. So I know this is a, a big eye chart, but I just want to show you in yellow is the city of Venice limits. So Venice, if you're familiar with it, um, it's on in Southwest Florida. You can see a little map in the, um, the bottom right. It's in Sarasota County and it's got its own airport um, that's a municip you know, municipality owned. And what you're seeing in those areas, my GIS director is a UF grad. So he always works orange and blue into any graphic. So if you ever see anything produced by Taylor and if he has to pick all the colors, it's always orange and blue, which I'm like, what? no, but it just cracks me up because he, he's probably listening right now. He's like, what? so yeah, you can see the orange and blue. Um, the orange that you're seeing is the John Nolan plan of the city of Venice. It's where they have historic architectural guidelines um, for the, the buildings there. Um, historic buildings are little orange triangles. Um, the blue is the downtown Venice area, a historic district. The green, you'll see that up on the water um, in the, the top left of the corner, Roberts Bay. That's a really cool Eagle Point historic district. We'll get back to that in a minute. You can see where it's located, surrounded on three sides by water. It doesn't really fare very well in a lot of our flood scenarios. Mm -hmm. And then the Edgewood historic district, which is inland a little bit, um, just to the right of the Gulf Intercoastal Waterway. So it's just, this is, no, this is mean higher high water. Um, all the graphics will look like this, and I'm going to go through them pretty fast so you can see where the flooding shows up. So this one, you don't see a lot of flooding. This is like today's nuisance flooding. It's just showing up on some of the roads. When I do three feet of sea level rise, I don't know if you saw what changed. I'll go back. Look in the bottom corner right just south of the airport, that lake down there. Lake got bigger. Okay. Um, along the um, Gulf Intercoastal Waterway that runs just to the right of the island of Venice, You'll see we got a little bit more flooding there and along all the creeks. So Venice tends to be fairly high. I just added three feet of sea level rise and I'm not seeing a ton of flooding. Um, the typical hot spots are lit up, but you, know, you have to zoom in pretty, pretty close on the map. But now look what happens when I do the 1% um, annual chance storm surge. So this is the 100 year storm. This is that one very close to what we had in Hurricane Matthew that I showed the pictures of St. Augustine. And check this out. Whoa. Now I'm seeing that entire green area that I pointed out, Eagle Point, is completely gone underwater. So is the area to the south of it. So is the area up by the jetty up in the top left, that Tarpon Center Drive. That whole neighborhood is underwater. Um, you can see down by the airport, we've got a lot more incursion of water. So once again, I'll go back. There's three foot of sea level rise. There's a 100-year storm or the 1% annual chance. Big time flooding. So then I said, well, what happens if I do one and a half foot of sea level rise with a 100-year storm? Whoa, significant. What if I do the 50 year storm, the 2% annual chance with one and a half foot of sea level rise? Still a lot of flooding. So then we go into focus areas and we say, where should we look? We really want to look closer. So we zoom in. This is an area called Hatchet Creek. Um, and you'll notice there's a very high concentration in the yellow in the, the bottom right. That yellow, if you look, it says utilities buildings. That is the water plant at the city of Venice. City of Venice is very revolutionary. They have an RO plant. They have a reverse osmosis plant. They've had it, I think, since like the late 70s. So it's really neat. There's not a lot of cities in Florida, especially small cities that have that. That water treatment plant is going to be underwater. You're like, oh, it's a water treatment plant. But if you think about, if you even know anything about RO, you can think about the expense that goes into the chemicals that go into treating the water that we're putting through the public supply. All of the pumps that are pushing the water through at a certain pressure to go through all the different membranes. Do we want that underwater? No. So we pointed that out. We're like, we got a problem here. This is a focus area. The coolest part was we went to the city, utilities came to the table. And I said, oh, we're already working on that. We have some plans. And they came to our next meeting and they had all of these plans that we were moving this backup generator. We're moving this tank. We're hardening this building. And it was great to see that they didn't need us to come in and do a study to tell them. They were already forward thinking. But having the study, they were able to say, we need some grant money. We need some, we need a little bit more public assistance. So um, doing an in-depth study like this really gets you to figure out where do we need to focus our attention. So I'm going to close and talking about adaptation. Because it's one thing to say, all right, we've got vulnerabilities. What can we do? And I don't want you to lose hope and think doom and gloom. Everybody's going to flood. We're all going to live on boats just like they do, you know, in Venice. And we're all going to be paddling around in our, our kayaks. You know, we as, as engineers and scientists, we have the tools. We have the technology. And we've been adapting for hundreds of years. You saw the curve. So, you know, the ways we look at adaption are you can protect, protect something. That means you just prevent it from flooding at all. Probably appropriate for something like a hospital or a nuclear power plant or an evacuation center, um, an evacuation route. 
but not appropriate for you know accommodation is you're allowing the water to flow in and out. You know, we're seeing some areas where, and I'll have a picture on the next slide where you allow water to actually flow in a building and out the building. So it, it's ways to um, to wet flood proof to allow water to just live with water. That's what the accommodation is. Manage retreat, um, manage relocation. Sometimes is a little more popular. You say retreat, and uh, a crowd of citizens doesn't want to hear that. I agree. Um, I don't want to retreat from where I live, but eventually we might we might be getting there. So it's good to talk about it. And then avoidance. Avoidance is what can we do? How can we buy up land, land acquisition, and turn it back into natural land? I'm seeing a lot of cities actually use um, Florida funds and um, national funds to buy repetitive lost properties, ones that are flooded multiple times, and turn them into parks and turn them into wetlands. And it's such a really great way to avoid avoid that area being flooded. It's expensive. And sometimes it seems not the best use of funding, but if you can make the economic case that you're avoiding so many damages and better for public safety, it's a great thing. So I've got just some pictures of some, some different adaptations. Um, the one at the top right is probably the most interesting. That's the wall that I showed the picture of that was completely flooded. And that's the before and after in the center um, there at the top is what the seawall looked like before. It was built in the 1800s and it was failing. So we kept the historic part of the wall. You can still see it in the picture on the right, but we built a stronger and taller wall next to it. And this one on the bottom right, I love, it's a glass and stone flood barrier. And you can see it's holding back is in the Lake District in UK. So we're trying to pilot some of those in Florida because I think that's kind of a neat way to hold back water when needed. All right, and then once again, that focus area, this is the one that I said float, water flows through in the top right. That is a restroom at, as a public restroom at a park and those little flood vents on the very bottom, that's where water can flow in and out of the building. Why? Because it's in the flood zone, it's in the high velocity flood zone. A building is full of air, right? So if you have a building that's concrete slab full of air and water comes up to it, it's got hydrostatic pressure, guess what it turns into? Not a building, a boat, right? You've seen it. You've seen, you know, in some of these horrible floods we've seen around the US and the world, buildings will pick up and float away. They're full of air. Even our big concrete building will float. We've had concrete ships in World War II. So, but if you put those flood vents there where you're, I mean, that's a public restroom, right? It's made of concrete. It's probably got a tile floor. It's probably meant for the public works guys to go hose it out, right? So what's the harm then in putting the flood vents there so the water, if there's a big uh, waves, can flow in the building and flow out, and that eliminates or reduces the hydrodynamic pressure on the building. So not innovative. They've been doing this for years. You can do this on your house. You can actually Google flood vents for my house, and they have them. Um, here in Florida, we don't have a lot of basements that we need those, but it's, um, it's definitely a way to just think innovative. And these are some adaptation areas we came up with for that Hatchet Creek focus area, something like a, a backflow preventer valve, like this one on the right. This is a duckbill valve. It's just, it's a stormwater drain. All it needs is head pressure to open when there's stormwater. And if not, it closes, it's just a rubber flap. It's probably the most basic one possible. Um, but when you have a high tide event, you're not gonna have that gravity upwelling of water like we saw in St. Augustine. So that is a duckbill valve because it looks like a duck. They are putting them in line now where you don't have to see them. So this one happens to be, I, I took it in person, but. The blue and the green are areas where they've either started or funded these projects for the water treatment plant. And we just gave them ideas, elevate your structure, elevate the utilities, put some flood vents in, maybe you need a backup generator. So just really general adaptation strategies. And then to close my key takeaways are, we're seeing that collaborating across jurisdictional boundaries is really important. So I wanted to put up on this slide the different regional planning councils that are colored there. I just saw um, today on Coastal News Today that the Southwest Florida Regional Resilience Compact um, led by Dr. Savrisi out of Florida Gulf Coast, published some Acuni sea level rise tool. It was like hot off the presses, showed up in the news this morning in my inbox that Southwest Florida has got some new sea level rise tool you can use. Southeast Florida has been kind of leading the way. So we're hoping the rest of the state catches up with regional resilience, like going out for big FEMA funding for looking at full scale watershed basins and environmental adaptations. And just how do we do this, a more systematic holistic approach instead of everybody over here popping up and doing different projects. I think conducting a vulnerability assessment, if you're a private homeowner, you can do one for your house. If you own a business, you can do it for your business. If you're a county or municipality, ask the state for money, they're funding them right now. We do need to start looking at assets. You know, are we adapting them? Are we mitigating, just slowing um, the flooding? Or are we looking at retreat? And then understanding those grant opportunities. And I went through a lot of them um, and I will leave you with that and take some questions. All right. Okay. Yeah, we'll start with questions in the room. And of course, everyone there on uh, Zoom and on YouTube, feel free to drop through the chat or uh, and I'll call on you. Any questions from, from the room? 
I have a question about the vulnerability assessments, which is if the state is funding them, are, are there like mandatory requirements of what's included? Because it seems like a lot of what you are sharing is like evaluation of critical assets and things like that is very much community driven. Um, so it can vary a lot from community to community. So like including like which sea level rise projection they pick. Right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it seems like the heterogeneity that can arise from local, so on the one hand, it's helpful to be local, adaptive to local communities and what their, what scenario they want to, uh, you know, um, respond to and what assets they find um, critical. But you think, I don't know, is basically DEP also mandating that there's some core components. To yeah, that. yeah, so that's why I had the slide up. So in May of this year, the state published this. It's the standardized vulnerability assessment scope of work guidance. It is a technical guidance that my team at Taylor created in concert with DEP, and we recommended here's the minimum standard. Okay. Here's the minimum sea level rise scenarios you should use. Here's the minimum storm surge. Here's the minimum rainfall you should look at. Um, here's the minimum resolution for the topography that you should assess. Here are the types of critical assets. Here Here's the range of who should be included on your steering committee. So it's it's not a very long document. I know I just covered all those and it seems like a lot. It's actually very abbreviated and has all those tasks that I outlined, but in much greater detail. We even talk about parallel flood guidance and like what has to go in with that, how you adopt your vulnerability assessment into your local mitigation strategy or county. So this is available. It's on the um, Florida DEP website yeah. under Resilient Florida, and you can download it. Like I said, it's a it's a PDF. It was just published and it, it's to help, as you said, standardize vulnerability assessments across the state. Because for the past four or five years, they've been lots of standards are out there. And if you're going to do look statewide, how do you compare what Miami's doing with what Pensacola is doing? So the question for those online, what role does the insurance industry play in all of this? Um, their standards are different from so do you mean private insurance or the FEMA National Flood Insurance Program? Because I think there's two different things there. So what's interesting is in our discussions, we had some focus groups we led with this with um, academics and business owners, the uh, state agencies and local communities to say, hey, what do you what do you want in this? Like, how, what, what's the kind of the best standard that you're seeing? What's interesting is we insurance doesn't normally come to the table to talk to us about it. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, these vulnerability tests, if you think about it, they're publicly funded for public assets. So this isn't something that your average homeowner is going to do. Um, I do know there are some businesses in Florida that are engineers and scientists that if you're going to buy a house, they will come in and they'll do a very quick vulnerability assessment for you and, and package it and sell it. But as far as I know, like every time I've tried to talk to insurance about probabilistic modeling of flooding, um, their little black box is proprietary and they will not share it. So I don't. I can't tell you what they're doing because this is very publicly focused. It's a good question. So like a developer or uh, or an insurance agent, the company could not use the slip to go run like all of the properties because you have to log in, you have to be a municipality. Was that one of the reasons why to keep it behind? You know, you've got this tool, like, yeah. you know, it's not perfect, but it's fast and it's like very useful. So did you want to not have a publicly funded tool end up causing insurance rate rises for home or maybe? Maybe. Maybe. Yeah, I mean, the the tool was created to implement a law that the legislature um, passed. And I know when for public or for publicly funded state or, finance major construction yeah. in the coastal building zone, like very specific. And what's interesting is the slip tool, when you see it today, it's only that coastal building zone. It's like a mile to two off the coast. So my mom lives in Tampa Bay in a condo in a high rise. And I would love for her to be able to run that for her condo, especially, you know, after the recent condo collapse in South Florida. And we've talked a little bit about that and what that looks like. We can't run that there because it's on the coast, it's on Tampa Bay, it's on Bayshore Boulevard in Tampa, but it's not on in that coastal building zone. It's not on the Atlantic or the Gulf Coast. So there have been talks, there was actually, I think I've got it in here in my slides. There was legislation um, just this past year that ended up dying in on the floor, but um, this legislation was going to amend the slip bill. And it actually redefined that coastal building zone to any area at risk due to sea level rise. So it would take those one mile boundaries and actually push them in to include tidal flooding. Um, it, it talked about within the next 50 years, they redefined what significant flood damage was. Once again, it ended up dying. I think it had second reading and they ran out of time. It was like literally the last couple of days of, of the cycle. I think it will be, I think it will be back next year, I hope, because I, I do feel like slips should be publicly available and there could be more that goes in there. So I have one more question about the slip, which is, is this inadvertently or maybe 
purposefully causing the state to essentially, when they try to do this slip studies, it's indicating that we shouldn't, the state shouldn't be investing in any infrastructure on the coast and therefore shifting, like driving them to basically to construct inland. So that's the. I'm just the, showing you as, as you're asking your question. Is that her question? Yeah. yeah. The, so. Yeah, I know you're saying. Yeah, basically, if the state's not going to, you have to submit a slip study to even justify any support, state support for construction there. Are you, or do you see evidence yet that that's causing the state to basically just, in, a, in effect, retreat? So even though this bill was, came out, it was in 2020, and then it became law, and then there was a rule, slip wasn't codified until this year. So the slip tool was not mandated for use until July 1st of 2022. So we don't have enough data, right? That's only, we've only been going for two months. So I think we don't have enough data to even know if it's, if it's changing people's decision making, which we would hope it would. Once again, the regulatory teeth aren't there. It just has the, you have to do a slip study. We're hoping though that, you know, the public investigative reporters are like, hey, we saw this slip study on this project. Why are we doing this? Okay. So it, the slip tool is very much a like 1.0. I, I, there are other variants we've been wanting to do the last two years. We were just very limited in time and budget to get something out there. All right, and we did get one question from the Zoom. If you're a student and you have to run to your next class, go ahead, but otherwise stick around for about three more minutes. So this is from Catalina McGarrican. She wants to um, ask if you can expand why the range of sea level rises was capped or why you suggest it might be capped at six feet rather than 10 and why you think in the Venice case, they only looked, they only wanted to look one to three. Mm, that's good. I usually have graphics on uh, sea level rise, but if you look at the most recent intergovernmental panel on climate change and what they are saying, you know, their high confidence, you know, what they think is really going to happen, the high confidence projections really don't go much above the uh, two meters by 2100. So right now we're telling our municipalities plan for six feet or less in to, out to 2100. Yes. But remember what we talked about at the very beginning, it's about 12 inches over the next 100 years. So if today's 2022, we're looking that 100 years from now, we will have one foot. But if all the ice sheet dynamics happen, and if everything that all of those countries say they're not going to reduce emissions, there is the possibility, and it's a high confidence, to go to up to six feet by 2100. So it's pretty far out there. And usually right now in 2022, we don't build buildings that have that design life to last to 2100 without some modularity or updates. All right, well, let's give one more round of applause to Dr. Shadell. Thank you so much for All right, and we'll see you all next week, same time, same uh, YouTube link, and thanks everyone for attending. And if you registered and you